How are you this morning? Good morning. I know you've got an Elsa dress and apples, and you've got two cans on your shirt, don't you? Okay, is this everybody? All right. Well, I'm not going to ask you to read my bracelet. I brought my bracelet with me this morning. I'm not going to ask you to read it because apparently it's so um, tarnished right now that nobody's been able to read it. So I'm just going to tell you what it says, okay? This bracelet, this is one of my favorites. It says, let your light shine. Let your light shine. I can read, I can totally read. You could totally read that? All right, good. There you go. <laughs> let your light shine. Good. I can read that. You can read that too? What does it say? Let your light shine. Very good. Okay, you guys might have heard that before because when we have a baptism over here in church, um, we say this. We have a, a verse from the Bible, Matthew 5, 16. It says, let your light so shine before others that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then we give that person a candle or sometimes their parents if they're little, right? <clears throat> so what do you think it means to let your light shine before others. What does that mean? Any ideas? What? Um, it means that the sun is shining. Well, the sun is shining, yes. Absolutely. God's love shines all throughout creation, doesn't it? Yeah. What else? Mm-hmm. Yep, your light turns on in the morning when the sun is up. How about congregation? How are some ways that you let your light shine in the world? Sometimes I'm at work and my mom believes I wake her up. You do. Yeah. You let, I bet you let your light shine all the time at your house, huh? <laughs> Luke, how about you? What does it mean? It means to be kind, right, and love other people and to share and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, hold on one second, okay? Can, uh, does it mean, does our light shine, does it, um, <clears throat> is it when we're successful, when we get to be number one, does that mean we're letting our light shine? Hmm? No, it doesn't. Friends always share at your school. So everybody's letting their light shine at your school, aren't they? Yeah, so... So success isn't really about being number one or having the most money or the most toys or whatever, the most of anything. Success is, I mean, letting your light shine is about being kind and loving to the people that you come and to contact with. And so, yes. Um, it means like, like sharing for goodness or like hugging someone if they feel sad. Hugging someone if they feel sad. Exactly. Yes, yeah, that's how we let our light shine. So we're going to talk here in just a minute in the sermon. We're going to talk a little bit about what Jesus means when Jesus uh, talks about power and, what, uh, and why we talk about children being just as important as the adults and so on. So we're going to give thanks now for God that we can all shine our light. And we don't have to be the most successful. We just have to love others. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for allowing us to let our light shine, and really our light is your light. So help us to shine your light through us to others. Help us to know that all we have to do is love and care for others for your light to shine. It's not about being number one or being successful in the ways that the world says. It's about being um, the person that you have created us to be. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's gospel, if you look in the Bible, actually is divided into two sections. It actually has two titles. It almost seems as if it's two different stories, or as we say in seminary, pericopes. Um, but as we've also been learning in Mark, Mark is a quick gospel and one thing leads to the other. And even though there's always this transition to the next thing or immediately or whatever, um, Mark is always tying everything that happens together as well. And so these two um, stories today that we hear, while they seem a little bit different, they even occur in different places, actually tie together 
very well. Um, as Pastor Steve said last week, this, is gonna, this gospel lesson today has the second time that Jesus tells his disciples of his impending death and of his rising again. Of course, they don't understand. Um, but I, I, I feel like we would respond the same way, wouldn't we? Um, what has their history been? So we're talking about a group of people that have been um, part of the Hebrew Israelite tradition. Now they're um, what the world is calling them the Jewish tradition or the Jews. And so what's their history? We look at the Old Testament and their history ha is pretty much that um, they conquer, right? They have a deliverer and they conquer, um, but then they, uh, uh, then they get conquered and then they're enslaved and then they're free, but then they conquer again, but then they get conquered and then they're enslaved and then they're free. Or we could also talk about how um, the Israelites fall short and then there's punishment and then there's forgiveness and then they fall short and then there's punishment and forgiveness. So this has kind of been the pattern all through the Old Testament. And so, of course, what they would expect from a savior that's come, a Messiah, they would expect the same thing, a deliverer a prophet, the kind that they've always received. And it would seem that they're confused because why would someone who's supposed to help them conquer their oppressors and be free again die? What kind of power is that? What are they going to do? How would that help anything? And how on earth do you rise after you're dead? So they are confused, as I believe we probably will, would be too, uh, yet a little concerned about asking because, as we know uh, from several of our other texts in Mark, um, they've already been rebuked a few times, and so they're like, I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask him, you ask him, okay? But as they move from Galilee in the first part of the story to Capernaum in the second story, so yes, two stories, but truly connected in meaning, they, um, they've kind of left that whole thing, confusion in the past, and now they're like, okay, well, who's the greatest among all of us? And they're talking about this, and they're arguing. Um, and my guess is, if they figure Jesus isn't going to be around to lead them, who's going to be in charge? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be you? Who will take the reins and lead the way? Or does Jesus think someone has the most power, and who is it going to be? Um, when Jesus uh, gives his power to someone else. This happens a lot. If you watch the Chosen series, actually, they do argue about this a lot. And when, when Jesus changes P Simon's name to Peter, it's, it is an uproar. It's craziness. So Jesus, once they get to Capernaum, asks once again, when they arrive, what were they talking about? And again, they don't want to tell him. I kind of picture it kind of like the parent-child scene, like, so... Have you been eating cookies in the cookie jar? Uh, 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 you tell them. You ask, right? They shouldn't have been talking about this. They know they shouldn't, so they don't really want to answer. But Jesus knows. He knows that they still don't understand what the entire purpose of his ministry is. And it's to show the world how God loves and how we can love as God loves. It's to show that he's here to save the whole world, not just one group this time, but everyone. That everyone will be lifted up. Not just the best, but all. And Jesus explains that it's really not about power, that kind of power that we think of in that sense. It's about the kind of power that we see in a child. To see the world with no judgment, but only curiosity. To see with innocent eyes. To learn from our surroundings. To love and be loved. And it's a love that is dependent on the parent as we are on God. Not thinking that we can always do it ourselves because we're the greatest, but that we always depend on God. Jesus shows that he hasn't come just for the high and mighty, but he's come for the lowest of the low, those who have no voice of their own. And in this culture, children would have been that way. And it's this kind of love that we love to hear about and that we really want to believe in. But in our society, in our culture, it's really hard to let go of a worldly understanding 
of power and success and who's lovable, isn't it? We live in a society that really um, values being the top dog, being number one, um, being the one with all the power. I like to think of it as, um, you know, when we, uh, I'm, an, I'm an Olympic junkie. I don't know about you guys, but two weeks of every four years, I'm zoned in on the TV. And, um, and I've, I've just been struck the last several times by how in America, every day, at the end of the day, we have the medal count, right? And it's not just like all the medals, you know, who has the most medals, but it's also who has the most gold medals, because second... You know, they, inter they interview these people and they're like, oh, man, you only got second. You're only second best in the entire world. Sorry, dude. You know, what is wrong with us, right? It's that kind of idea that we see and hear in our culture all the time. So it makes it hard to believe what God's power is all about. I think often, too, of what something my seminary professor shared with me during a time where I felt like I really, um, you know, I was that idealistic seminary student. I was going to get out and I was going to change the world. Everybody's going to believe in Jesus and it's going to be great. And I was so disappointed time and time again. And he finally said to me, Heather, I know you want to be seen and you want everybody to hear what you have to say. But remember that you only have a circle of influence and that most people only have a very small circle of influence in their life. But when you impact your circle, then each one of them has a circle that they impact, and each one of them has a circle that they impact, and so then the ripples go on and on and on. Perhaps another way to say it is through the philosophy of Charles Schultz, the uh, writer and author of the Peanuts cartoon. I bet you never thought you'd hear the gospel according to Charles Schultz, did you? You don't actually have to answer or like say out loud, I'm going to name some statements, and uh, you don't have to say these out loud, but I just want you to think about them, okay? So this is the philosophy according to Charles Schultz. Name the five wealthiest people in the world. Name the last five Heisman Trophy winners. Name the last five winners of the Miss America pageant. Name ten people who have won the Nobel or Pulitzer Prize. Name the last half dozen Academy Award winners for Best Actor and Actress. Or name last decade's worth of World Series winners. Now, there might be some of you out there that are trivia buffs, and you could roll off the names like that, maybe. I, most of us, I don't think, can. Most of us were probably trying to think of one or two as we went through this list. But the point is, none of us really, truly remembers yesterday's headlines. These are no second-rate achievers and achievements in the world, and yet the applause dies, the awards tarnish, their achievements are forgotten, accolades and certificates are buried with their owners. I was thinking about this as I was reading this yesterday and thinking, why do I still have a stack of blue ribbons from elementary track and field in my closet? <laughs> so here's a new quiz. How do you do on this one? List a few teachers who aided your journey through school. Name three friends who have helped you through a difficult time. Name five people who have taught you something worthwhile. Think of a few people who have made you feel appreciated and special. Think of five people you enjoy spending time with. Was this easier? You probably even could see the faces of these people in your minds as I was asking these questions or stating these, stating these, making these comments. So the lesson here is that the people who make a difference in your life are not the ones with the most credentials or the most money or the most awards or the most power. They are the ones who love you and care for you the most. Jesus understands that his ministry isn't about giving new people power or taking power away from other people. It's really about giving power back to God. And it's about understanding that God's way, while it's not what we would expect from an all-powerful God, is really about serving others, 
stepping aside and, and lifting up all people, especially those we don't normally lift up, seeing everyone as equal and worthy in God's eyes. Jesus' death is impactful because it isn't a military victory, it isn't a death in battle, but it's a death that we also die into and are raised up with him into new life. So one last story to help make the point in our own context today. It's another Olympic story. I could talk for hours on the Olympics. It's about a woman named Tara Davis Woodall. She, um, for those of you who didn't watch as many of the Olympics as I did, she's a long jumper and she's from the US and she won uh, the gold medal in the long jump this year. Um, but the story is really about her husband, Hunter Woodall, who's a Paralympic athlete. And, um, and he was in the stands and we saw just as much coverage of her husband as we did of her because he was so excited to cheer her on and be there for her. And when she won, she went running to the stands. I thought he was going to jump out over the thing, but instead it almost, he almost pulled her into the stands with him, just crying and cheering. And so I follow this guy on Instagram named Emmanuel Acho, and he talks about these viral videos and pictures of this moment. And, um, and after... Uh, he, after his original post, he comes back and he makes a second one. And this is his second one that I, got to, that I got to experience. He says, I lied. I lied to over 30 million people. He shows up a picture of um, Tara and her husband when she's winning the gold. And he says, this isn't relationship goals, at least not in its entirety. So then he holds up another picture and it's Tara and she is got her arms wrapped around her husband as he is sitting and weeping. And he says, what you're looking at now is a picture of Tara comforting her husband, Hunter, in a, para a Paralympic athlete, because before the Paralympic World Championships during warm-ups, a screw came loose in one of Hunter's prosthetic legs. He tried to repair it, and while doing the block start, the entire leg shattered. Hunter notably said that it's one thing to lose a race, it's another thing not to even be able to start. He couldn't even compete in those games, and in that moment, his wife Tara comforted him. Now, while we've all seen the viral images of Hunter cheering Tara on and cheering her on to an Olympic gold medal, that in and of itself isn't relationship goals. Relationship goals is your partner your friend, your significant other, standing by you in your lowest of lows in effort to one day achieve the highest of highs. You can impress someone, he says, with your success, but you can impact someone with your scars. And I believe there are no more impactful scars than those of Jesus. 